Welcome back class. Let's begin our discussion of chapter 13 on personality. Well, what are the ways of looking at the self? We'll be reviewing several theories and approaches to this. Freudian psychodynamic views, the unconscious parts of the self, humanistic view of the self-actualizing person, examining traits including the big five factors, social and cognitive influences on personality, self-esteem and self-serving bias. These different perspectives and concepts can help us examine what we have in common, personality components, basic drives, stages of development, categories of traits, and the ways in which we differ, individual paths through the stages, ways of managing basic drives and needs, levels of trait dimensions. So we start off by looking at Freud's work and the psychodynamic theories of personality, bringing out the unconscious part of your personality. Freud and the psychoanalytic on personality structure of id, ego, superego, personality development or psychosexual stages, defense mechanisms. The neo-Freudian psychodynamic theorist from sexual to social issues. Assessing unconscious processes through projective tests. And the modern ideas about the unconscious and other Freudian concepts. First, we start off with a definition of what we mean by personality. Personality, an individual's characteristic patterns of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors persisting over time across time and situations. Now, understanding the mind in a new way was one of the things that Sigmund Freud is credited with. These psychodynamic and psychoanalytic theories, these theories of human personality focus on the inner forces that interact to make us who we are. In this view, behavior as well as human emotions and personality develop in a dynamic interplay between conscious and unconscious processes, including various motives and inner conflicts. Freud's path to developing psychoanalysis. Sigmund Freud started his career as a physician. He decided to explore how mental and physical symptoms could be caused by purely psychological factors. He became aware that many powerful mental processes operate in the unconscious without our awareness. So, the, this insight grew into a theory of the structure of human personality and its development. His name for his theory and his therapeutic technique, psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis techniques. Techniques for revealing the unconscious mind. That's cornerstone to his belief in theory here. That there are things going on in the unconscious that are causing issues with the person today. These things could have developed when they were younger, but they are problematic as an adult. So he had techniques for revealing the unconscious mind. He used creative techniques such as free association, where he encouraged the patient to speak whatever comes to mind. The therapist then interprets any potential unconscious wishes hidden in the client's hesitations, slips of the tongue, and dreams. Freud's personality, the mind iceberg. The mind is mostly below the surface of conscious awareness. You'll see often this iceberg used to illustrate this basic idea. You can see most of the iceberg is beneath the surface of the water. And in doing so by using this graph, this graphic, what we see Freud is communicating is that most of the things which we are we are unconscious of, we're not aware of, that we're looking at things like the id and the superego, okay? Whereas the ego, the things which helps us to operate on a day-to-day -day basis is fully above the waterline or conscious to us. We are aware of it. 
Remember in a previous chapter, we talked about consciousness and the two-track mind. Consciousness is that sense of being able to be aware of yourself in your environment. And what we understood from that chapter is this, that there are going to be certain aspects, things that go on to which we're not going to be aware of, that we are processing some way. But then the things that we are aware of, they're sort of like in our immediate field. We know that we're sitting watching a lecture or sitting in the classroom. So this iceberg is a way to sort of illustrate some of these key concepts about not only the unconscious, but also the personality structures. So personality develops from the efforts of our ego, our rational self, to resolve the tension between our id, based in biological drives, and the superego's society's rules and constraints. So the unconscious, in Freud's view, is a reservoir of thoughts, wishes, feelings, and memories that are hidden from our awareness because they are unacceptable. The developing personality. We start life with a personality made up of the id, striving impulsively to meet basic needs, living by the pleasure principle. In a toddler, an ego develops, a self that has thoughts, judgments, and memories following a reality principle. Around age four or five, the child develops the superego, a conscience internalized from parents and society following a morality principle. The ego works as the executive of this three-part system to manage bodily needs and wishes in a socially acceptable way. Freud's theory of psychosexual stages. The id is focused on the needs of erogenous zones, sensitive areas of the body. People feel shame about the needs and can be fixated or become fixated at one stage, never resolving how to manage the needs of that zone's requirements or their needs at that particular time. Here are the stages of Freud. The old stage from zero birth to around 18 months where the focus, the pleasure centers on the mouth, sucking, biting, chewing. The anal stage from 18 to 36 months, pleasure focus on bile and bladder elimination, coping with demands of con for control. Phallic stage from three to six years, the pleasure zone is the genitals, coping with incestuous sexual feelings. Latency from six years to puberty, a phase of dormant sexual feelings, and the genital stage, puberty on, maturation of sexual interests. Male development issues. Freud believed that as boys in the phallic stage seek genital stimulation, they began to develop unconscious sexual desires for their mothers and hate their father as a rival, feeling guilt and fearing punishment by castration, ergo the term you may have heard before, castration anxiety. He named these feelings the Oedipus complex after the story from Greek mythology. The resolution of this conflict boys begin to identify with their fathers rather than seeing them as a rival. Quickly, the story of Oedipus, I'll cut to the chase here. The story of Oedipus is a man, uh, an adult man, kills another man. Okay, and he, unbeknownst to him, this man he just killed is his biological father, his birth father. Later, he then marries the man's wife. Okay, and this person, a queen, becomes his wife. And eventually he does learn that he has married his mother. Now, Freud believed that we are anxious about our unacceptable wishes and impulses. And we repress this anxiety with the help of strategies, 
these strategies below are called defense mechanisms. So let's look at some of these defense mechanisms and also examine their unconscious process employed to avoid this anxiety arousing thoughts or feelings and then give you an example. Let's go with one of the classics of rationalization. Rationalization, offering self-justifying explanations in place of the real, more threatening, unconscious reasons for one's actions. A habitual drinker says she drinks with her friends just to be sociable. That is a rationalization. Displacement. Shifting sexual or aggressive impulses toward a more acceptable or less threatening object or person. A little girl kicks the family dog after her mother sends her to her room. Obviously what this, this suggests here is that the little girl could not get away, mostly, with kicking the mother. Therefore, she displaces her aggressive impulses to something that she can get away with kicking and that, unfortunately, is the family dog. And then we have denial. Refusing to believe or eventually perceive painful realities. Example, a partner denies evidence of his loved one's affair. So, here are a couple of examples, a little bit more deep detailed here. A politician gives anti-gay speeches, then turns out to have homosexual tendencies. This would be reaction formation. Switching unacceptable impulses into their opposites. So he has homosexual ideas or tendencies and he uh, switches to the opposite and becomes a, a politician that focuses on anti-gay uh, ideas as well as arguments and, and laws against marriage for, of the same sex and so on. Someone with an anger problem accuses everyone else of being angry and threatening. This would be projection. Uh, the idea of anything in you that you find unacceptable, you project that which is part of you onto other people. So these two are sometimes confused with each other. The common theme, as with all defense mechanisms, they seek to prevent being conscious of unacceptable feelings. The difference is this. The first one, reaction formation, compensates and the second one distracts. Neo-Freudian psychodynamic theorists. Psychodynamic theorists such as Adler and Horney and Jung accepted Freud's ideas about the importance of the unconscious and childhood relationships in shaping personality. The id, ego, and superego structure of personality and the role of defense mechanisms in reducing anxiety about uncomfortable ideas. Real quickly here, the Neo-Freudians were uh, theorists and psychologists that came after Freud and based a lot of their work on Freud's work. But as we can see here, they accepted many of his ideas, but not all of them. So the psychodynamic theorists differed from Freud in a few ways. Adler and Horney believe that anxiety and personality are not a function of social, not sex, excuse me. Adler and Horney believe that anxiety and personality are a function of social, not sexual tensions in childhood. And Jung believe that we have a collective unconscious containing images from our species experiences, not just personally repressed memories and wishes. Carl Jung, highlighted universal themes and the unconscious as a source of creativity and insight, found opportunities for personal growth by finding meaning in moments of coincidence. Alfred Adler focused on the fight against feelings of inferiority as a theme at the core of personality, although he may have been just projecting his own self. And Karen Hornai criticized the Freudian portrayal of women as weak and subordinate to men. She highlighted the need to feel secure in relationships. So assessing the unconscious, psychodynamic personality assessment. 
Freud tried to get unconscious themes to be projected into the conscious world, making you aware of them, through free, free association and dream analysis. Projective tests are structured systematic exposure to a standardized test of ambiguous prompts designed to reveal inner dynamics of the person. Here's an example, a Rorschach test. It's an ink blot. They would show a series of ink blots, these ambiguous prompts, to their patients. And the patients would say what it is that they're seeing. By stating what they're seeing based on these ambiguous prompts, the seeing, what they are perceiving, is coming from the patient. Therefore, the idea is the patient is projecting their inner qualities or characteristics or thoughts or wishes onto this ambiguous stimuli. Unfortunately, when it comes to this type of test, there are some issues or problems. Results don't link well to traits. For example, there's low validity. And different raters get different results, and that's low reliability. So there were some flaws in many of Freud's ideas. So let's examine real quickly here flaws in Freud's scientific method. First, unfalsifiability. He developed theories that are hard to prove or disprove. Can we test to see if there is an id? If we can't do such a thing, then we can't truly test this theory. It's unfalsifiable. We can't prove it false unrepresentative sampling. He did not build, that is Freud, Freud did not build his theories on a broad sample of observations. He described all of humanity based on people with unusual psychological problems. Biased observations. He based his theories on his patients, which may give him an incentive to see them as unwell before his treatment post facto explanations or hindsight bias. Rather than making predictions, he did of what was called post predictions. So rather than making predictions, whether or not uh, a situation makes you anxious or not, you could either be fixated or repressing. So the same behavior could be explained by two different approaches with his theory, because he used them to describe things that have already occurred after the fact, he did not make predictions, more postdictions or post facto explanations. So let's see how Freud's work has fared over the years. Evidence has updated Freud's ideas. Development appears to be lifelong, not set in stone by childhood. Infant neural networks are not mature enough to create a lifelong impact of childhood trauma. Remember, we talked previously about things such as infantile amnesia. Peers have more influence on personality and parents less than Freud assumed. Dreams, as well as slips of the tongue, have many possible origins, less likely to reveal deep unconscious conflicts and wishes. We may ignore threatening information, but traumatic memories are usually intensely remembered, not repressed. This will result sometimes in this post-traumatic stress disorder. We don't forget things that are traumatic to us, okay? So we don't repress them. They're very much part of our memory and sometimes our day-to-day -day life, unfortunately. Still, sexual abuse stories are more likely to be fact and less likely to be wish fulfillment than Freud thought. Gender and sexual identity seem to be more a function of genetics than Oedipus conflicts in relationships with parents. So let's look at the unconscious as seen today. Processing, perceptions, and priming but not a place. The following processes operate at an unconscious level, not because they're repressed, but because they're automatic. Schemas guide our perceptions. We talked about schemas in the chapter on developmental psychology. 
the right hemisphere makes choices that the left hemisphere doesn't verbalize. We talk about certain differences between the hemisphere and chapter two on the biological basis of behavior. Conditioned responses, learned skills and procedures all guide our actions without conscious recall, like procedural memory that we discussed in the chapter on memory, as well as conditioned responses that we talked about in the chapter on learning. Emotions get activated. Stereotypes influence our reactions. And priming affects our choices. So the unconscious we know of today is part of many things that happen automatically within us when things get gets processed like uh, wherever we are in a room we're processing things at an unconscious as well as at a conscious level okay so there's lots of going on in the unconscious and so the idea here that uh, this may suggest is that our unconscious is a stream sort of a always changing thing going on depending on where we are in an environment uh, and picking up and processing all this information and not just simply a static reservoir of information that is repressed as Freud may have envisioned it. So what is Freud's legacy? Freud benefited psychology definitely giving us ideas about the impact of childhood on adulthood human irrationality, sexuality, evil, the fence, the fences and fence mechanisms, anxiety, and the tension between our biological cells and our socialized, civilized cells. Freud gave us specific concepts we still use often, such as ego, projection, regression, rationalization, dream interpretation, inferiority complex, oral fixation, sibling rivalry, and Freudian slips. Not bad for someone writing over a hundred years ago with no technology for seeing inside the brain. So developing a healthy genuine human personality. So now we've talked uh, so far in this particular uh, lecture about the ideas of Freud. Remember in a previous lecture we talked about behaviorism. So now we're going to be talking about a slightly different area or focus of psychology, the humanistic theories of personality. We'll be looking at Maslow becoming a self-actualized person, Rogers growing in a social environment of genuineness and acceptance. We'll discuss empathy, assessing the self, evaluating humanistic theories, what about evil and too much individualism. So, humanistic theories of personality, Abram Maslow and Carl Rogers. In the 1960s, some psychologists began to reject the dehumanizing ideas in behaviorism and the dysfunctional view of people in psychodynamic thought. Maslow and Rogers sought to offer a third force in psychology, so a force that is different than the behaviorism and different than the psychodynamic perspectives. So this third force offered by Maslow and Rogers is the humanistic perspective. They studied healthy people rather than people with mental health problems. Humanism focusing on the conditions that support healthy personal growth. We've already discussed this next slide already, but we'll go over it again. This is Maslow's, the self-actualizing person. In Maslow's view, people are motivated to keep moving up a hierarchy of needs, going beyond getting basic needs met. So we have the physiological needs need to be met before we have safety needs, safety needs before belonging needs, esteem needs before self-actualization. At the top of his hierarchy are self-actualization, fulfilling one's potential, and then self-transcendence, seeing that there are things more important than the self. So in this ideal state, a personality includes being self-aware, self-accepting, open, ethical, spontaneous, loving and caring, focusing on a greater mission than simple self-social acceptance. 
Rogers' person-centered perspective. Rogers agreed that people have natural tendencies to grow, become healthy, and move toward self-actualization. The three conditions that facilitate growth, just as water, nutrients, and light facilitate growth of a tree, are genuineness, being honest, direct, not using a facade, acceptance, or unconditional positive regard, acknowledging feelings without passing judgment, and empathy, turning into the feelings of others, or excuse me, tuning into the feelings of others, showing your efforts to understand and listening well. So we have genuineness, acceptance, and empathy. These things help facilitate and move you toward a more healthier you and toward self-actualization. Assessing the self and humanistic psychology. Ideal self versus actual self. In the humanistic perspective, the core of personality is the self-concept, our sense or of our nature and identity. People are happiest with a self-concept that matches their ideal self. Thus, it is important to ask people to describe themselves as they are and as they ideally would like to be. Questionnaires can be used, but some prefer open interview. Questions about actual self. How do you see yourself? What are you like? What do you value? What are you capable of? If the answers do not match the ideal, self-acceptance may be needed, not just self-change. Critiquing the humanistic perspective. What about evil? Some say Rogers did not appreciate the human capacity for evil. Basically, what they're saying here is that the humanistic perspective painted a very rosy picture, so to speak, of humanity and human nature. Rogers saw evil as a social phenomena, not an individual trait. So from his perspective, he would say something like this, and he's quoted as saying, when I look at the world, I am pessimistic, but when I look at people, I am optimistic. So the idea here is that people can be good. They're not inherently evil, but society, the world may make them so. And we saw a similar idea discussed in a previous lecture on social psychology about the power of the situation. And obviously the world is the series of situations we find ourselves in uh, as we go about our daily activities in life. So the humanist response, self-acceptance is not the end. It then allows us to move on from defending our own needs to loving and caring for others. So self-acceptance is not the end. It allows us to move on from defending our own needs to loving and caring for others. So some say that the pursuit of self-concept that we see in the humanistic perspective and accepting ideal self and self-actualization encouraged not self-transcendence, saying that there are things more important than you, but self-indulgence or self-centeredness. The humanist response to this, the therapist using this approach should not encourage selfishness and should keep in mind that Positive regard means acceptance, not praise. So you can accept uh, something that the person is, but you do not necessarily praise them for it. Trait theories, social cognitive theories, and the self. So getting you to think about the qualities you may see in yourself. Traits are stable components of personality. Dimensions and factors, assessing traits through the MMPI, the five canoe factors, the impact of traits in situations, and vice versa. Social cognitive influences on personality. We have reciprocal determinism among thoughts, social situation, and behavior. Internal versus external locus of control, and optimism and positive psychology. So let's start. The self 
we have the spotlight effect, self-esteem, and self-serving bias. We'll review some of these ideas. So personality is seen in the uh, palms and stars. The idea oftentimes that people can tell us about ourselves, our futures, and things of that nature. You may look at the horoscopes or, or even call if they have a second hotlines anymore. The idea is that by saying something that is vague and likely to be true of you, then following up on comments that you reinforce by nodding, uh, someone can appear to see into your soul, your, 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 your inner self. You too can turn your keen sense of obvious into career and predicting the present. So the idea here is there are techniques that people can employ that can sometimes convince people they ha may have a greater insight into to the future or to people who've moved on like past ones that they're trying to have some sort of connection with now after they've died. The notion here is that people can read aspects about your behavior by picking up on cues and then when they make a statement of something that you have picked up on uh, you may nod or show greater interest that yes you are agreeing with what they're saying which tells them to keep trying keep on that particular path in order to convince you that they have some particular insight so the idea here is that your personality, uh, the traits, the characteristics that you possess, there's much of this that you communicate very openly when you're uh, interacting with other people and sometimes they can use that to give you a sense that they know more about you or about the future than they actually do. So what is trait theory of personality? Gordon Alport decided that Freud overvalued unconscious motives and undervalued our real observable personality styles and traits so remember Freud was looking at things that we could not really observe this was things going on in the unconscious what Alport is suggesting here is that we need to look really at what we do see the traits the characteristics and things that we can observe in order for us to get a clue about one's personality we have Myers and Briggs wanted to study individual behaviors and statements to find how people differed in personality, having these different types of traits. The Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, MB MBTI, is a questionnaire, questionnaire categorizing people by these types of traits. Now, a trait is an enduring quality that makes a person tend to act a certain way. For example, you could say, you may have a friend that you know is honest because you know that's a trait of theirs that basically trait is a way in which you see that they can respond to certain situations uh, with a certain degree of honesty or a friend could be shy you know how they will respond in a variety of situations too because that is an enduring quality that makes a person tend to act in certain ways the MBTI traits come in pairs so they have these 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 clusters of ideas about how people behave and think and feel and so they're using these traits to sort of categorize people on these characteristics of either judging perceiving thinking versus feeling and things of that nature what how you respond to these items give us an idea of what traits seem to be prominent in an individual so trait theory of personality that we are made up of a collection of traits behavioral predispositions that can be identified and measured traits that differ from person to person for example again your friend that you go go to school with may be honest your scan, your friend that you hang out with uh, in your neighborhood they may be shy okay your cousin may be more hard working than your brother so these traits help us to distinguish characteristics uh, between one individual and another so traits are they rooted in biology well brain extroverts tend to have low levels of brain activity making it hard to suppress impulses and leading them to seek stimulation extroverts are the people who uh, are sort of like the life of the party they go into a party and then they go meet and interact with bunches of bunches of people as opposed to an introvert who wants to go 
hang out in a corner of a room somewhere with the wall to their back because they don't want all that stimulation. The body. The trait of shyness appears to be related to high autonomic system reactivity and easily triggered alarm system. So people who tend to be shy, they have this very sensitive alarm system and the alarm system goes crazy if they're around too many people and too much activity is going on. So they find some place to sort of control the stimuli in their environment so their alarm doesn't continually go off. Genes. Selective breeding of animals seems to create lifelong differences in traits such as aggression, sociability, or calmness, suggesting genetic roots for these traits. So as you may be aware, if you are a pet owner, that some dogs have certain types of personality traits, so to speak, that may make them more likely to be good around children or to be better at being a guard dog or a hunting dog, for example. Now, this next idea I'll just touch on real quickly here is something called factor analysis and personality dimensions. Uh, a factor analysis, uh, identifying factors that tend to cluster together. It can be sort of a complicated idea, but the notion is this, that by uh, providing many questions to a variety of items, uh, we can see what types of items tend to cluster together. And that means they form factors. So using factor analysis, uh, the Eisnicks found that many personality traits are actually a function of two basic dimensions, okay, along which we all vary. So we have the dimension of stability. We either tend to be unstable or stable, or we have the, the dimension of extroversion. We tend to be either extroverted or introverted. And so by having these two dimensions, we can see the qualities and traits on sort of like a little scale here that goes around the, the, the circle that we see here. So someone who tends to be extroverted and unstable, they could be described as touchy, restless, aggressive, excitable, changeable, impulsive, optimistic, or active. Someone who goes on the other scale, they're more introverted and stable, they may be seen as passive, careful, thoughtful, peaceful, controlled, reliable, even-tempered, or calm. So the idea here is that by looking at these dimensions, we have a great deal of traits, okay, that now can help us to describe individuals. So research supports their idea that these variations are linked potentially to genetics. So assessing traits via questionnaires. We have a personality inventory, a questionnaire assessing many personality traits by asking which behaviors and responses the person would choose. We have empirically derived tests. All test items have been selected uh, to because they predictably match the qualities being assessed. We have the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, designed to identify people with personality difficulties. True false, just a true false questionnaire. The items were select, selected because they are correlated with various traits or emotions or attitudes. And by responding to them, we get some idea of the personality of the individual who's responding to the survey. An example would be this. The press people tend to answer true to the following. Nothing in the paper interests me except the comics. So if you respond true to that, that would basically say you are tending more toward depression than not. Now, the big five personality factors. So when we do all this research on personalities, what was discovered after some time was that there seems to be certain traits that always seem to appear and they started referring to them as the big five. So the Eisnicks felt that people varied along these two dimensions. Current cross-cultural research and theory supports the expansion from two dimensions to five factors. Conscientiousness, self-discipline, careful pursuit of, delay, for, of delayed goals, agreeableness, helpful, trusting, friendliness, neuroticism, anxiety, insecurity, emotional instability, openness, 
flexibility, nonconformity, variety, and extroversion, drawing energy from others, sociability. So what this is suggesting is this, that these personality factors, when we did all this research, these five factors kept appearing so they start referring to them as the big five and to help us remember these five factors we can form a canoe c conscientiousness a agreeableness and neuroticism o openness e extroversion canoe helps us to remember these are the big five the big five personality traits so looking at the big five canoe on personality dimensions so by looking at this, and we referred to dogs previously here, we can sort of assess a personality on the dimensions of these big five characteristics here. So we can say how conscientious is this dog or person, how agreeable, how neurotic, how open or how extroverted. And so the idea is by looking at uh, a tool to help assess these big five personality dimensions we get an idea about the person uh, one thing that we've seen over the last few decades is that more and more people or businesses are using personality surveys or personality tests in order to use this as part of the tool to determine whether or not they want to hire a person or not so this is a very powerful tool that sometimes can be used for a variety of reasons questions about traits these topics are the subjects of ongoing research stability one's distinctive mix of traits doesn't change much over the lifespan however everyone in adulthood becomes more conscientious and agreeable and less extroverted neurotic unstable and less open predictive value levels of success and work and relationship relates to traits such as openness and conscientiousness so if you have openness as one of your traits and conscientiousness as one of your traits this is more related to success and work as well as relationships heritability for most traits genes account for about 50 percent of the variations among individuals change versus consistency shifts with age over years of development, we change interests, attitudes, roles, jobs, and relationships. We develop skills, get into maturity. Do traits stay stable through all this change? Well, the evidence shows that it takes time for personality to stabilize. Traits do change, but less and less so over time. We change less and become more consistent. So as we age, we are becoming more consistent i guess in a way you see that many of our traits have sort of stabilized and then there's the person situation controversy i have not been focusing on the cartoons here but let's look at this one here i'm going to france i'm a different person in france this is basically saying we have a person but if they change their situation change where they are it may change who they are or the traits that they display for example, if you are going to church this Sunday, you're going to go to church with your church-going attitude, your church-going self, not as if you're going to a party. That's a different situation, different behavior. So trait theory assumes that we have traits that are a function of personality, not situation. But there is evidence that some traits are linked to roles and to personas we use in different cultures and different environments. So personality affecting the situation, not just a function of the situation. Your Facebook posts, your website, music list, choice of ringtone, these all reflect your personality. These choices also may shape how others treat you, which may affect your personality. So this room may reflect the personality of the guy who lives there. The setup and contents of the room may also shape his personality. So basically, the room and how the room is structured and the things in the room that you live in 
okay, may reflect who you are, the personality that you have. But at the same time, that room may influence who you are. So we have the social cognitive perspective. Albert Bandura, whom we've discussed several times already, believes that the personality is the result of an interaction that takes place between a person and their social context, involving how we think about ourselves and our situation. Questions raised in this perspective, how do we interpret and respond to external uh, events? Uh, how do these, those responses shape us? How do our memories, expectations, schemas influence our behavior patterns? And how do the personality and social environment mutually influence each other? Well, this is how we see it, or Bandura and others see it. Reciprocal influences in becoming. The kind of person who does rock climbing. Reciprocal, a back and forth influence with no primary cause. This is an example. So you have a person who likes rock climbing, okay? So they learn to rock climb. The interpersonal factors, thoughts, and feelings about risky activities. They now have personal factors. They then look for rock climbing friends, okay? Which then entices them to do more rock climbing. So a tendency to enjoy risky behavior affects choice of friends who in turn may encourage rock climbing and other types of exciting and risky behaviors which may lead to identifying with an activity of more rock climbing or uh, or risky types of behavior and so what we see with these bi-directional arrows is that everything is influencing each other they have a reciprocal influences that will sort of entice us to have internal factors environmental factors and behavior aligned with a certain activity for example so reciprocal determinism how personality thoughts social environment all reinforce and cause each other why is jake happy smiley person he may have started with an easy temperament he may attract other happy people and people are more likely to smile when around him which reinforces his smile his mind fills in the reasons why he's smiling, even if some of it was a reflection of his happy friends. And these happy reasons give him more reason to smile. So the idea here is that it's feeding each other, this reciprocal determinism. So looking at personality, the biopsychosocial approaches to personality. We have biological influences that are going to be genetically determined temperament, autonomic nervous system reactivity, brain activity, psychological influences, learned responses, unconscious thought processes, expectations and interpretations, as well as social cultural influences, childhood experiences, influences of the situation, cultural expectations, and social support. So let's review some of the theories that we've talked about so far regarding personality. We have the psychoanalytic theory of Freud. He was a key proponent of that. The assumptions are that emotional disorders spring from unconscious dynamics, such as unresolved sexual and other childhood conflicts and fixations at various levels of developmental stages and the use of defense mechanisms to fend off anxiety. His view of personality consists of pleasure-seeking impulses of the id, reality-oriented executions of the ego, and an internalized set of ideals in the superego. His assessment methods were free association, projective tests, and dream analysis. The psychodynamic perspectives of the key proponents of the neo-Freudians, Adler, Hornai, and Jung, the unconscious and conscious minds interact, childhood experiences and defense mechanisms are important looked at the dynamic interplay of conscious and unconscious motives and conflicts shape our personality. They use projective tests and therapy sessions. The humanistic perspective of Rogers and Maslow, rather than examining the struggles of sick people, it's better to focus on the ways healthy people strive for self-realization. The view of personality, if our basic human needs are met, people will strive towards self-actualization and a climate of unconditional positive regard. We can develop self-awareness and a more realistic and positive self-concept. They use as tools for assessment questionnaires and therapy sessions. 
Then we have the personality theory of traits by Alport, Eisnick, and others. We have certain stable and enduring characteristics influenced by our genetic predispositions. The view of personality, the scientific study of traits, has isolated important dimensions of personality, such as the big five traits, and the personality inventories are how they are assessed. And then the personality theory of social cognitive by Albert Bandura. Our traits and social context interact to produce our behaviors. The view of personality, conditioning, and observ observational learning interact with cognition to create behavioral patterns. Personality assessment methods, our behavior in one situation is best predicted by considering our past behaviors in similar situations. Now let's explore the self and viewing the self. Research in personality includes the topic of a person's sense of self. Topics of research include self-talk, self-esteem, self-awareness, self-monitoring, and self-control. The field has refined a definition of self as the core of personality, the organizer and reservoir of our thoughts, feelings, actions, choices, and attitudes. Topics for our study of people's sense of self, the spotlight effect, self-esteem low and high benefits and risk, self-serving bias, narcissism, self-disparagement, and secure self-esteem. Now let's look at the spotlight effect. An experiment. Students put on a Barry Manilow t-shirt. Who is Barry Manilow? A long time ago. Barry Manilow t-shirt before entering a room with other students. Manilow was not even cool back in the day, some would say. The result, the students thought others would notice the t-shirt, assumed people were looking at them when this was not the case. They greatly overestimated the extent to which the spotlight was on them. That leads us to the spotlight effect. Assuming that people are having attention focused on you when they actually may not be noticing you at all. So sometimes if we have a stain on the shirt or something a little bit off and we're out in public, we may have this spotlight effect, believing that eyes are on you. The lesson is this, people don't notice our errors, our quirks and features in shirts as much as we think they do. So the spotlight effect is us highlighting in our own mind whatever issue that we may be aware of or whatever concern that we may have. The idea, however, is that we may be overestimating how much interest other people actually have in us. Self-esteem, high, low, good, and bad. People who have normal or high self-esteem feeling confident and valuable get some benefits. Well, we have increased resistance to conformity pressure, as we saw in social psychology, that if you have a low sense of self-esteem, you're more likely to follow along and conform to others. Higher self-esteem, you're going to be less, less, less likely to be influenced by the roles of others and behaviors and standards of others, so you don't conform as easy decreased harm from bullying and an increased reliance and resilience and efforts to improve their own mood. So those are definitely positive benefits of having normal or high self-esteem. But maybe this high self-esteem is really realistic and as a result not a cause of the successes. Low self-esteem even temporarily lowered by insults leads to problems, prejudice, being critical of others as examples. Self-serving bias. We all generally tend to think we are above average. This bias can help defend our self-esteem as it does for this people in this will. So at least I'm not as dumb as she is. At least I'm not old like her. I'm not poor like that bum. I'm nicer than my backstabbing ex-boyfriend of mine. So the idea is here is that we are biased for ourselves. So we generally 
think, for example, as we started off, that we're all above average. But in reality, we all can't be above average. It, the averages don't work that way. So we have a self-serving bias. Self-focus and narcissism. Since the 1980s, song lyrics have become more focused on the self, both gratification and self-praise. Empathy scores and skills are decreasing and decreasing and being lost. People increasingly don't bother trying to see things from the perspective of others. There is a rise in narcissism or self-absorption, self-gratification, inflated but fragile self-worth. Narcissists see themselves as having a special place in the world. The danger, especially in narcissism, when self-esteem is threatened, it can trigger a defensive aggression. So the idea here is that people who are narcissistic are very see themselves as very uh, important and critical even. Uh, their sense of self-worth tends to be inflated but fragile. So when someone questions them or goes against something that they may have stated, this can cause a very negative defensive aggressive reaction. Preventing this aggressive defense of self-esteem, uh, not raising self-esteem but reinforcing it, having people state their own values and qualities. So the idea here is that we do see there are some particular issues that can occur with all the self-focus. Self-disparagement and self-acceptance. Left behind in the supposed increase in ego egotism, uh, those who feel worthless and unlovable, some people have a habit of self-disparaging self-talk. I'm no good, I'm going to fail. Sometimes such remarks are a sign of depression or at least feeling inferior. Sometimes such remarks may elicit pity or prepare us for possible bad events or help us learn from mistakes. People are more critical of their past selves. Moving from defensive to secure self-esteem requires realistic expectations and self-acceptance. Culture and the self, individualism versus collectivism. These ideas we've discussed several times in the course already. Individualistic cultures value independence. They promote personal ideals, strengths, and goals pursued in competition with others, leading to individual achievement and finding a unique identity. A collectivist cultures value interdependence. They promote group and societal goals and duties and blending in with group identity with achievement attributed to mutual support. Individualistic versus collectivist cultures compared. So here we see with the individualism, they're independent, discover and express one's uniqueness, me, personal achievement and fulfillment, rights and liberties, self-esteem, change reality, defined by individuals, many often temporary or casual confrontation is acceptable, behavior reflects one's personality and attitudes. And the collectivism, interdependent, identity from belonging, maintaining connections to fit in and perform a role, us, group goals and solidarity, social responsibilities and relationships and family duty, accommodate to reality, defined by social networks, duty based, few close and enduring uh, harmony, har harmony is valued, behavior reflects social norms and roles. So we can see the culture itself can have a great deal of impact on ideas of self and what we seem to be focused on. So, people in collectivist cultures, those which emphasize group unity, allegiance, and purpose over the wishes of the individual, do not make the same kinds of attributions. The behavior of others is attributed more to the situation. We saw this in our discussion of social psychology, where we see people commit the fundamental attribution error. This is the opposite. The behavior of others is attributed more to the situation in collectivist cultures. Credit for success is given more to others, not necessarily the individual, but for example, you have a student who's a great student, uh, have great uh, academic achievements. They'll say stuff like, well, it's not me. I had great teachers or I had a great uh, study group or whatever. The idea is they 
can credit credit the success to others and then they blame for failures is taken on oneself I was not good at this particular task I failed